Very good. So um, here we have it. I just wanted to show you first. This is uh, the operation that I was showing last time. If you remember, we took the co-product. We twisted every, uh, every uh, uh, component. So we took a matrix unit or a matrix unit in a matrix. We uh, wrote it as a co-product, a dual of the product, the dual of the multiplication. We twisted each component with, uh, with an element W, which is a permutation here. Yes, and then we took the multiplication back and we divided by a number, uh, William, so the number is the number of cycles of the, so it's a power N, which is a Coxet element. Uh, so the power is uh, the number of cycles of the permutation minus one. So we divide by n to the number of cycles of the permutation minus one. This is a random matrix with uh, non-negative integers so that it has no accidental zeros. Here we do the identity. Here we do the transformation four, five. As you see, it's exactly the entries and the dots are zeros, yes? So it projects here, so this is a, this is a high matrix, it's, a, it's over, a high dimension is four, so this is over SL4. Yes, so it's, a, it's too higher than usual. And you can see that uh, here's another one, the cycle is three, four, as you can see again, it introduces a lot of zeros, yes? So basically it makes it more diagonal. This one, the numbers in red are not in the original matrix. So here, this is a cycle. This is uh, not uh, two cycle, and the, the proof works only for certain things. And I mentioned exactly what those things are. Uh, here's another one in which it works. So the black, black means that exactly the numbers in the matrix. Yes. So this is a projection. The projection is done by making some entries of the matrix zero because they don't match after they're rotated. So this allows uh, us to, uh, to um, axiomatize the higher matrices, which uh, uh, we won't do now in the course. So uh, once now here, there are all the 120 or so, so it's a permutation of fives here. So 120, uh, things tested and the ones for which, uh, for which uh, things work are here. And as you see, this includes uh, the, the, the ones for which we get a projection are here. This includes all the elements basically of, uh, uh, with uh, cycles of length one and two. So this is length one and length two, and a few of the others, but we are interested only. And uh, most importantly, this does not work. This works for anything other than over SL2. So over SL2, there's nothing. Very good, this is one thing. I wanted to show you a few things before we go to the next topic. The other one, uh, is you see there's quite a bit of programming, yes. So uh, as I said, the, this whole project involved maybe uh, half a million uh, lines of mathematical programming over the years, which is about the same as the, uh, as the operating system of uh, Windows or something. So uh, yes, so this is... Uh, so here we go further in that file. There is a file on higher matrices. And here, this is, I wanted to show you here, as you can see, uh, this is a picture that we had before. Yes, yeah, so these pictures will be made part of the book, the pictures that appear here. So here you can see that we position the mirrors. Here they're in magenta, yes. The graph AN is in magenta, yes. And we choose a point which uh, and we reflect it in the mirrors and in the affine mirrors as well. And the period is here, the period for the weights is in gray, 
the periods for the, the period for the roots, which is a diagonal higher matrix, is in yellow. We can take it either as a rectangle or we can take it as a permitohedron. Can you see either of them contains exactly six, three pluses and three minuses? Yes, so this is a high HIJ. And the interesting thing for which I wanted, which I wanted to show you now is that uh, uh, is the, uh, uh, so the interesting thing is a D case. So in the D case, remember we had a mirror in the middle if you, uh, for the HIJs. So for the high HIJs of SL3, what we have is a rotation by 120 degrees around the middle point. Can you see? This is basically the graph D, as you can see it on the cover of the conformal theory book. That one was folded. This edge is glued to this one, right? So you bring it together and you make it like an uh, ice cream cone or something, yes? Right? And the point in the middle is separated into three. Now look what happens if you have a point in the middle here. So once again, now you have three times more things, yes? Three times more points. Because you take uh, the previous thing of type A and you reflect it around the center. I mean, you rotate it around the center by 120. Yes, so you have three times more things and the, you take the period to be one third of the previous one. So the period is this, uh, this yellow or the gray uh, rectangle. And as you can see, it has again exactly six, three pluses and three minuses. Yes, the roots are again of length root six. But what happens if you have a point in the middle Remember in the case D, I was telling you that the mirror has an extra slot, which becomes plus or minus one, yes? So again, what you want is the, uh, uh, the higher roots here have length square root of six. In the, in the case D, it should have square length square root of six. So what we're trying here is the following. We have defined the higher roots using the ribbon. Yes, in the case AN, we have used, uh, we, we have shown that they, are, that they are concrete vectors. In this case, the vectors with six components, three pluses and three minuses. And the inner products are exactly the ones between these vectors, yes? So we get the inner products from the ribbon, we need to make fine vectors which have them as inner products in the case AN. This is a case D. So in this case, what you have is you need six more slots. So I had to do a lot of uh, simulation. I don't know it higher, th further than S over SL3. So over SL3, you need here six, uh, six extra slots because you have now only when you are, when the point is in the middle, instead of having Six, you have only two points. So the other four are on this, on these. These slots are empty normally. They don't, everything is zero there. You understand the notion of a slot? You have a vector, yes, in a vector space. And the vector space has a basis. These entries, we call them slots. Yes, so you have, for instance, a vector, 10 uh, entries, yes, and uh, uh, a few of them, so here the, the slots are these points, the roots, which are in the period, except that when, this, when a point reaches the middle, instead of six, we have only two points, and then it turns out that in general there are six more slots. And the, the uh, uh, entries in these slots, you see here there are two plus ones and two negative ones. The entries are determined by one, the parity of the mirror center. So the mirror center, even the roots 
if you have weights, weights have a parity, but if weights have a parity, roots have a parity as well. This one's not used very often, but we use it here. So one is determined, so it's like a clock. One, uh, one is determined by the parity of the, uh, of the mirror position, and the other is a parity of the leg. Remember that this point separates into three. Yes, so we have there three legs. And uh, I, won't, uh, uh, I won't speak more about this. Here's a model for, the, uh, for one of the other orbifolds. I just want to make sure that, I, I, I just wanted to, to tell you that for, orbi for all the orbifolds, the A, B, C, D type things, there are uh, vectors which give you the inner products of the roots. You understand? We we build the roots with a we build the roots with a ribbon. Yes, but in the cases of the orbifolds A, B, C, D, the roots are concrete vectors. Okay, that's all I wanted to tell about the, the things before, and now we're going to go to a. Uh, to a new chapter, uh, so you can almost uh, you can almost forget about all the rest, and uh, if you if you uh, are a mathematician or a physicist, then you will need to make new friends because this is a completely uh, new type of uh, mathematics that's being used. So it's not done by the same people as before. Uh, so what we're going to do is uh, um, define uh, something that I introduced as plates. A plate is a permitohedral cone. So you, we take the permitohedron, and remember that we have permitohedra in any, uh, for any underlying graph, uh, simple Lie group. But uh, let's take here the case An. So we're going to take a permitohedron, and we're going to take uh, cones in this permitohedron. So a non-degenerate. Around this point, you have a non-degenerate cone. So let me, um, you see this is a cone here. Around an edge, so if you take a point at a vertex, you have a non-degenerate cone, yes? If you take a point on an edge, you have a degenerate cone, which is in this case is half a plane. Uh, if you are in the center, then this gives you the whole plane, the neighborhood of the point. Yes, so you have points with different levels of degeneracy. And uh, uh, we're going to define now a, uh, so we work, we work in uh, the, uh, root space, which is uh, r to the, uh, in the d minus one dimensional root space of SLD now. So what we have is a space x of coordinates x, which is xi, i is 1 up to d with the sum of xi equals to some number which we'll put, uh, uh, let's take it to be s here. Uh, typically, one takes this s to be zero, but uh, for instance, if you have a, uh, uh, 
a, a simplex in this space. Let me show you here a, a typical labeling. The directions here, the coordinates are one, two, three. Uh, this coordinate will be, in this case, 3, 0, 0. It's in the direction 1. This one would be uh, 2, 1, 0, 1, 2, 0, and 0, 3, 0, yes? And the center will be 1, 1, 1. So you can see that if you have a simplex of edge, uh, so this is uh, good for a simplex of edge uh, D. That sum will not matter much. We can uh, we can change it from one uh, when we work with one or the other, and. Uh, uh, now, uh, we'll take the standard uh, plate. So, standard plate to be x1 bigger than uh, uh, 0. So this is for the case S is equal to 0. x1 is equal to 0. x1 plus x2 is bigger than or equal to 0. x1 plus up to xd is bigger than or equal to 0. This one is an equality, actually. We introduce a notation xs to be the sum of uh, uh, i in S of xi for a subset, for S a subset of uh, d bar, which is the set 1 up to d. And uh, more generally, we have a uh, a plate, a plate has the following form. So let's take uh, S1 union, disjoint union with S2, disjoint union with SK to be equal to our set D bar. And uh, S1 plus S2 plus SK to be equal to our sum S. And in this case, the, the equations for a plate are X S1 is bigger than or equal to S1, little s1 x s1 disjoint union with s2 is bigger than s1 plus s2 and x s1 union with s2 union with sk is bigger than or equal to s1 plus s2 plus SK. The last one, so this is put here just for completion. This one is, in fact, the equality X, uh, XD is equal to S. XD equal to S, I'm going to raise it a, a little bit.
So these are plates, and we're going to denote that plate, that last plate, by a double bracket, uh, S1, little s1, s2, little s2, up to sk, little sk. So the, these are called, we're going to call them lumps. This is a plate, that was the definition of a plate. SI are lumps. So let me give you an overview here of what we are doing. You remember maybe from the the special lesson on uh, on the Gelfand settling, at least on the view that that new view of the Gelfand settling by growing vegetables and so and bending them, uh, that we could get that way representations. So what we want is to construct the combinatorial basis for such representations in general. So we want to do the whole program of Hermann Weyl for these higher, higher matrices. And this is what it involves. So the SIs are lumps, uh, are, will we call lumps, yes? And if they are, so non-degenerate, plate means, uh, all lumps have size of one element, or that it's non-lumped. Yes, you can see there on the permitohedron that uh, the lumps, uh, so the, the uh, the non-degenerate plates correspond to the vertices, the neighborhood of the, the conic neighborhood of the vertices of a permitohedron. Yes, the uh, if you go to an edge, or uh, in the extreme case, if you go in the center of the permitohedron, then you have, uh, for instance, a single lump there. Yes, and in that case you see the equation is satisfied by all points, so you get the whole plane, yes? Very good, so now, and this is what this picture is, um, now the idea is to, uh, to uh, work, so let me define here, redefine if it's uh, uh, if it doesn't lead to uh, uh, to any confusions that will identify a combinatorial plate equal to region subset, subset of uh, the sum of the x size equal to s, and by the way, we take it as up to, up to, uh, call, higher co-dimension equalities up to higher co-dimension. We identify this to, uh, to uh, its characteristic function.
which is one inside and zero outside. So it's one where the equations are satisfied and zero where they're not. So what we are studying is linear. We study the linear combinations with coefficients in, uh, well, depending on our context in Z, R, or C of uh, plates. Now, what we're going to work with, as you can see from the, from the equations, are the following we call a special hyperplanes the hyperplanes uh, xs equal to uh, some number a in z So these are the special hyperplanes and also the special hyperplanes and half planes so the half planes are x s bigger than or equal to a The reason for working with these special hyperplanes, there is a deep reason for this. The, uh, when we work with SL2 over SLN, I mean with underlying SLN, so this would be uh, here, uh, this would represent one of these. You see here it's a simplex with four vertices. Here d is equal to four. Uh, the representation, the representations of this higher SL2 will uh, involve uh, things of H2. Now remember here on the, on the face of this, you can represent the usual SL2 in the gelfand settling. Uh, you have a power E1 to the power K1, E2 to the power K2. These are K1 wires of this kind and K2 wires this way, yes? Now, this is replaced here by surfaces in the, in the uh, simplex of H2. And these surfaces have the following property. If you notice here, please uh, watch for a second. Uh, if you notice here, this such a hyperplane separates the coordinates in two. So uh, these could be numbers of coordinates. For instance, one and three is here, two and four are here. Yes? So uh, this hyperplane would be x1 plus x2 is equal to one. For x1 plus x3 is equal to one. Or x2 plus x4 equals to the other part which is also one, yes? So the idea that uh, I took from the gelfand settling is that uh, basically you model uh, the, high, the SL2 to obtain SLN. So you, you build the SLN out of things which locally are like SL2. Yes, so you have here these tunnels and so on. So the hyperplanes here, once again, are exactly of that kind, X subset. These have, appears in, uh, have appeared in the 1950s, uh, such hyperplanes in the, 19, in the 1950s in, uh, in something called retarded K 
QFT potentials Uh, a, a little bit of the structure has arrived there. I have found this reference where, uh, using the counting of uh, pieces, uh, they were around the point where you sum a fine ones, uh, quite a bit more general, and uh, they didn't look at the structures that we are using at all. So now, the problem is the following. When you start to intersect these special hyperplanes, you will obtain, when, so the intersections, the, uh, the special hyperplanes cut the ambient space into convex pieces called shards. So you take all of them. Now, if you look in the, uh, uh, in a usual, in a plane, there are only two kinds of shards. You see, here, the triangle standing up and the triangle standing down. In, uh, in 3D, there are 10. In eight, in, uh, so in four coordinates, there are 10. Those, that's in three coordinates. Um, and uh, if you go up to eight coordinates, you have uh, uh, something of the order of the number of atoms or in the universe or something like this. Uh, uh, even up to permutations, there are about uh, 40,000 different kinds of shards in eight coordinates. Um, looking at these shards uses some of the uh, deepest questions in number theory, like determinants of Hadamard matrices and so. And uh, so the, the ambient space, the shards, are basically, one cannot, they are not classified, and it's not clear at all that they are classifiable. One can put, uh, make theorems about them, but write down theorems about them, but, but not the classification. So, uh, however, we need to find relations between these plates. And uh, uh, what I found is that uh, one should uh, go from plates to trees. So here I'm going to describe the move from plates to trees. Um, this is a standard plate that you see here. Yes, it's x1 positive, x1, 2. As you can see, the definition does not use uh, special properties of 1, 2, 3, and so on. Yes, so up to a permutation, every plate, up to a relabeling of the coordinates, every plate can be, can be put in this, every non-degenerate plate can be put in this form. And now, you see, uh, so now we're looking at things around, at plates around the uh, uh, point. So the case when uh, the center is zero. Yes, when all the right side is zero. Now, you are in a sphere. How can you define a cone, a polyhedral cone? One way to define it is to specify its boundary. Yes, so you specify its oriented boundary. And look, the boundary is here, for instance, for this. It's x1 plus x2 bigger than or equal to zero, as you can see. Yes, and <coughs> the other boundary, the other piece of the boundary. Now, if you specify the boundary of a cone, think uh, in, uh, in terms of... Uh, of uh, algebraic geometry. Uh, here I have a question for you. Let's see, uh, you should be able to figure this one out. 
if you specify the boundary of a cone, uh, then uh, uh, up to what is a cone defined? I mean, how two, two cones which have the same boundary, not cones, two, two regions which have the same boundary, differ by what? Well, in principle, I think of the boundary as a jump. The boundary is, a, is like a derivative, yes? You, you go from one to zero. You see, from one inside to zero outside. So if you know the derivatives, then the function is defined up to a constant, yes? And indeed, instead of going, for instance, with, uh, 60, with 120 degrees like here, you could go around with 120 plus another 360. Yes, 2 pi over 3 plus another 2 pi, right? So in order to eliminate that ambiguity, you can do two things. Uh, one, you could specify the value at a point, but that would uh, rely too much on that point. Or in the case of a cone here, you can specify the uh, average at infinity. What the average at infinity is, you, is you take a big sphere centered anywhere, you take the sphere centered at any place, and you compute the limit of the proportion of your cone out of the volume of the sphere. So the, your cone intersected with the sphere divided by the volume of the sphere, yes? And you can see uh, easily that uh, this one occupies one-third by symmetry of the space, yes? So uh, what we're going to take is take one-third the whole space. This is a tree. It's a tree with one lump, one leaf. Yes, it's uh, one, two, three here. And is a whole space, yes? So it's one-third the whole space. And then we specify its boundaries as these two trees. And if you notice at the boundaries, this, uh, this part is uh, half a line, yes? Do you see? Half a line. This means that it's a plate as well. And this one is a plate, so, so the region uh, where x1, since you see you have here two regions, x1 plus x2 is positive, and the other region is x3 is positive, the, the complement, yes? And since your plate is on the side x1 plus x2, you put the, its side on the left-hand side, yes? So you, you choose this way a binary, you make this way a binary tree. Is this part clear? So this binary tree means that x1 plus x2 is positive, yes, and x3 is negative. And here x1 is positive, do you see we are toward 1, yes, for the bottom thing. And x2 plus x3, which is the bottom, is negative, yes. So, and then by induction, we go, we, we develop these, this half line. You see the average at infinity of this is one half, yes? Now we'll give a definition which, which uh, so this is the intuition for the definition, let's say. We're going to give a very precise definition in a second. And uh, so this is a full expression of the plate one, two, three by uh, trees. Do you see? So it's one third the tree, one, two, three, with one lump, one, two, three. Do you see? It's, it's one third of the plane because the plate occupies one third of the plane. This part clear? Then, it's one half of this. This is uh, the line, yes? And this boundary occupies half of the line. Can you see? Yes, so it's one half of this and one half of the other. And finally, on this line, which is x, do you see this line is x1 plus x2 is positive. 
you go, you orient it toward what? X1 or X2? The plate is in the direction of X1, yes? So you have a second node and you separate it into one and two. Yes? So you can see this way, we, we obtain this way uh, uh, the, the, plate the plate decomposes into, into flags. Yes, you, uh, you know the, uh, well, this is maybe not the mathematical definition, but the commercial definition of a flag is that you have a node, then you have a, an edge, which is a pole coming from that node, and then you have the fabric of the flag, yes? So this is what you can see here. Do you see this is a flag? You have a, the, the pole goes in the orange direction and uh, the uh, fabric uh, goes in the, always you choose one of the two normals. So you get this expression, yes? So uh, the expression now is the following. So that was the motivation of the definition. The definition is now the following. For the plate, uh, for the plate S1, so we map the plate S1, S1, the double square bracket, up to SK, SK, into a sum of trees. with as follows. We call S1, this sequence, S1 up to SK, the canopy of the trees, so this for our foreign students are the leaves of the uh, leaves and branches of the trees, so call S1, SK, the canopy. Partition, partition the canopy into uh, so this is a sequence called this, this is a sequence called the sequence is, so this is an ordered sequence, yes? Canopy into uh, uh, parts which are a set composition, that's a name used in combinatorics for this, which means ordered partition, ordered partition into unordered parts. T1 up to TL where T, TJ is equal to SIJ union with SIJ plus one you, this joint union with S I 
i j plus one minus one. And let's take t little t j to be equal to the sum of the corresponding numbers s i j plus s i s i j plus s i lower j plus one plus s i j plus one minus one. And now, um, define a binary or use a okay, binary layered tree. It's a tree, binary tree. with one node per layer. These are into one-to-one -one correspondence, as we'll show next time, with permutations. So this is a typical uh, layered tree. Uh, look at the notes here. There's one node per horizontal layer. Yes? So we take the binary layer tree, trees with T1 up to TL. And we're going to take a sum. So we're going to put here T1 with and TL with TL as leaves. The subsets with a lower index like that. And we take the sum then the sum over all t t's of the sum over all layer trees, layered binary trees underneath of a coefficient times this, where the coefficient is simply, can you guess it from there? Do you see you have a one half and a one half, do you see? And there's a one third. So the coefficient is equal to the uh, lumping number. The coefficient is one over the product Of over every uh, uh, j of the number of si's in t j. This is a binary layer tree, and in order to uh, Two more minutes. So we 
So this is the expression of uh, plate in terms of trees. Uh, do you notice there exactly that this satisfies? We have glued, we, we have there a lump two, three, and the lump one, two, three, right? And uh, we have one more thing which we need to take out of algebraic topology, namely uh, two of these cones, when they have a surface in common, they should glue. So the surface should be the negative of the surface viewed from the other side. So in order to do this, we take, uh, yes, the expression, we anti-symmetrize. So let's put here anti of this. And the anti, the anti symmetrization of a t binary tree is a sum with signs of the permutations of the tree at every. node. So what we do is, uh, for instance, when we have one, two, three, we map it into one, two, three, minus two, one, three, uh, plus, minus, uh, three, one, two, plus three, two, one. Yes, so we anti-symmetrize every node. This is done for gluing. And this is the expression of a tree. So this way, we have expressed every matrix in terms of trees, and I want to show you um, the opposite part. So uh, we could show, we could use this. So we need this in order to work with these plates. Otherwise, just writing them in terms of uh, the shards which they cover is unfeasible because the shards are too complicated. Trees are much better. And as you see, trees will, enco will encode uh, later some Riemann curvature. Now, backwards, it turns out that you can take any tree and make it a function in the plane. Exactly a linear combination of plates. So uh, we'll show next time the backwards map from trees to plates and show that if we add the trees, if we add the trees, look here, this is a, uh, this is a case uh, uh, on the blackboard. Yes, if we add these trees, uh, so these are the regions uh, into which the trees are mapped. Notice here the first one is one third indeed of the whole plane. Yes the tree which represented the plane. This tree, so red is plus, blue is minus. Yes, so this is a plus one, minus one, over two factorial because there are two branches. And here we have also the lumping number, one quarter of the, one, one half of this. Yes, one half of this one. And then this is a tree here, and we'll write the rule and so, and if we add these trees, we'll get exactly one in this region and zero outside, which is a plate, yes? So the, this map from trees to plates can be reversed to a map from plates, uh, I mean, from, from place to trees into a map from trees to plates, yes? And as you see, the trees encode in a very simple way. Uh, 
Riemannian curvature, discrete Riemannian curvature, and everything. So the next step will be to find, to show this map, pr prove that it's inverse. Uh, this gives rise to a, a possibly entirely new direction in uh, the combinatorics of symmetric functions. Uh, as I said, you need uh, new friends in mathematics for this. You visit different people. And uh, and uh, um, uh, so, so, so you have the map back and forth, and then we'll, we'll uh, so in the end, we'll build enough uh, simplicial geometry to, uh, we'll have to prove relations between trees, between these plates, yes, bases and relations, which are quite uh, beautiful, all kinds of things, chess boards from which the chess pieces run away in all directions, uh, so all kinds of uh, combinatorics. So this, is, if you ever wanted to do some combinatorics, uh, this will be the next, uh, the next uh, few weeks. And finally, what we'll have is our higher matrices acting on such things. Yes? So such things will give you vectors, and the higher matrices will act on these vectors. Okay, I'll stop here. Uh, what you